our generation and the generation after us has some pretty daunting grand challenges to address to secure our future on planet Earth. So some of the grand challenges include things like food security for the growing population, aging population, and the health challenges it brings with it, meeting our ever-growing industrial demands, and really doing this without completely destroying our environment, and safe, scalable, and sustainable infrastructure, things like your you know, drainage systems, your high-rise buildings, your metro systems, um, and your nuclear power plants. And do all of that while taking people out of dangerous jobs and unrewarding jobs. And it turns out robotics is already addressing some of these challenges. It's playing a big role in autonomous driving cars. We can see robots playing a huge role in medical diagnosis and treatment, as well as you know, improving the efficiency of our collaborative manufacturing settings. But sometimes we have to think completely outside the box. And this talk is about one such, if you may, completely crazy idea. It's about making ourselves a multi-planetary species. So, why would you want to do that? You know, space travel's cool. Beam me up, Scotty. You know, I've been wanting to do that in front of a big audience like this all my life. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay, so all jokes apart. So what if we could look at the health benefits of, say, living in microgravity as we age? What if we looked at, say, being able to get infinite supplies of rare earth materials on an asteroid or another planet? What if, and this really without mining our oceans and completely destroying our, our ecosystem, what if we could move the heavily polluting industry from Earth to another planet which does not have the same problems by these emissions? So to be able to address this, we have to look at several technological challenges, not least the rocket and booster technologies, planetary orbital technologies, being able to, say, create food on an alien planet, look at potentially alternate sources of harvesting energy. But we have looked at one small part of the puzzle in this big roadmap. So we've been looking at developing humanoid robots for unmanned pre-deployment missions on Mars. So you might ask, what's the point of doing that? Well, the vision is that robots like this, humanoid robots like this, would go ahead of astronauts to pre-deploy assets on the surface and potentially maintain these assets once the astronauts have left. It makes Mars missions about 40 to 50% cheaper than manned missions, but most importantly, you're able to test and validate untested technology on real fields without putting human life at risk. So to be able to carry out this vision, what kind of technological advances do we need to make? In other words, what kind of capabilities do we need to pack in the picnic box for our robot before it heads off to Mars? So one of the challenges, the robots have many sensors which sense the world around it. It also perceives the world around it using these sensors. And for example, that little image that you see there is an example of a robot's view of the world. So going from such you know, raw sensors to real world information about what is graspable, what is movable, how can we figure out what is an obstacle is a hard problem. And we've been trying to tackle that using machine learning techniques. Another challenge is real-time control. How do we send about 1,000 hertz signals to control a robot, 1,000 hertz meaning 1,000 signals a second, to control the motion of a robot so that it's very dynamic and reactive? Of course, when robots work very closely with humans, we have to make sure that these robotic platforms are safe for interaction. So we've been developing compliant technology to enable this. And finally, it's 
impossible to plan everything and code for every, every eventuality, especially if you're going on a mission to Mars. So we need ability, like just the humans do, to learn from data and experience and adapt your behavior based on these systems. So that is precisely what you know, we've been trying to do on humanoid robotic platforms. And here's an example, a video of one of these robots being put through its paces. So what it's doing is it's effectively using its sensors to map the local world around it. It's trying to figure out what are places where you can step on without falling over. It's then using these control algorithms to control this in real time while making sure you know, the, the environment uh, it, there's no obstacles, it doesn't fall over. So all of these challenges has various steps in terms of planning, control, navigation, and adaptation from motion. And these are exactly the challenges that I talked about. But you might think that all of the stuff that I'm talking about, you know, um, it's a bit exotic. Is there any relevance to real-world situations? So it turns out the technology, the development of the technology that we're doing is moving the robotics of yesterday to something where we are creating more and more autonomous systems. So going from teleoperation to more autonomous systems. But really the big challenge, the next big challenge, is to create systems that can seamlessly go between these two extremes. So can we create systems that have the ability to seamlessly transfer between human in the loop control to autonomous behaviors? And one of the examples of a research like that that we've been doing is in the area of robot-assisted inspection and maintenance. So for example, here's a, a robot, quadruped robot, and you might hear something in the background of a robot trying to you know, walk on stage. Well, I think it's had a little, uh, little hiccup, but we'll try and see if it can get on stage. But in the meanwhile, the, the video shows the robot being able to go into areas that are extremely hard for other wheeled robots to go. It can climb steps. It can go inside the drainage systems for you to inspect and manipulate and do all sorts of other things. So uh, indeed, um, addressing these kind of challenges for inspection is a, a big, big uh, thing that we're trying to address. And here's Animal. Here's the quadruped robot that I was just talking about, and the advantage of this robot over wheeled systems is that it can go on terrain that is much more uneven, it can climb over steps, and I can, for example, go and interact with it. So it has got this compliant motion, and obviously having safety, having systems that are much more safe and compliant is one of the key aims of the robotics development. So it's not just quadruped robots, it's not just wheeled robots, we can also apply this concept of shared autonomy to various domains with fixed robots. For example, we've been trying to use this in nuclear and off-road decommissioning projects, in disaster recovery scenarios, as well as collaborative manufacturing and you know, remote operations. If you go to London and you see the Crossrail project, some of our robots actually try and take humans out of uh, really harm's way. So it's not just in this domain, but there's another domain we've been trying to apply this concept of shared autonomy is in the area of rehabilitation, disabilities, and assisted living for the aged. This is one of our grand challenges. Um, so let me welcome Ella on stage. So she is the cyborg for the day, but uh, her day job is she's an she's a, um, undergraduate student doing engineering with us. So for all her sins, she's been wearing um, this two pieces of technology on her body. So the, the thing that you see in the lower half is an exoskeleton which can apply forces on uh, Ella's legs while she walks in order to assist her. So obviously this can be used for, on healthy people to reduce fatigue, but it's also equally applicable for rehabilitation scenarios for stroke patients. Um, and the, the scientific challenge there is to try and blend the forces that Ella's muscles are applying to the device, at the same time, blend this with the torques that the motors are applying to give her a seamless assistive experience, which is not trivial. So the, the next bit I want to try and do uh, and have a look at is the upper limb prosthesis. So this is um, an upper limb prosthesis to which I'm actually going to try and attach myself using 
and, and try to control this using my biosignals. So in other words, we're going to try and operate this prosthetic hand um, using the signals that come from my hand. So you can see that by manipulating and sending the high-level volition of open and close, the, the actual prosthetic hand responds to this in exactly the same way. So now if I just grab an object like this and try to grasp it, the high-level volition is coming from me, but the robot hand is making decisions on its own when to stop closing each of its fingers depending upon the shape of the object that it's trying to manipulate. So for example, if I now try to grasp something else, um, the object actually decides, uh, the, the, act the hands actually decide when to stop closing. This is a perfect example of shared autonomy. So in, in theory, we could now, this is a fully connected device, so I could, for example, take my mobile phone out and open an app and, uh, for example, connect this device to my mobile phone and operate it as well. So, for example, now if I attach it, you can see that even for moving my hand, I can connect using my mobile phone to this device. So here's an example of a three-way connection between a third-party device, my biosignals, and the AI in the hand. You can see how quickly it gets very complicated. So thank you, Ella and Chris, um, for, for that demonstration. So we have, we have actually seen, so we have actually seen um, robots in the news recently a lot, you know, robots taking jobs. Um, but indeed, we have to worry about all of these issues, like ethical implications of deployment of robotic systems. How do we deal with security, for example, if, uh, how can you ensure that a third-party connectivity to a device that you're wearing is secure enough. Uh, we have to worry about social impacts of wealth distribution, and we have to really worry about reskilling our, 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 uh, our workforce. But having said that, unless there is a big natural disaster in the next 20 years that takes out 50% of our elderly population, and I really hope that doesn't happen because I'll be one of them, or if we decide, unless we decide to go back to living in caves, or unless we decide to give up our cell phones and GPSs and not travel very far from home. Robotics technologies are absolutely essential to solve some of our problems of today, and it's not an option but a necessity. So hopefully, we can think big and think outside the box, plan carefully so that the robotics technologies of tomorrow that we're developing is for the social benefit of all. Thank you very much, goodbye, and maybe, just maybe, we'll see you for breakfast on Mars.